Nina Simone was born Eunice Kathleen Wayman in Tryon, North Carolina in 1933. And she was a piano genius as a child. And so her whole town rallied around her and groomed her to be the first black woman to excel in classical piano. So a lot of people don't know that. They know her mostly as a, as a singer, but she's actually just a wonderful pianist, and she played classical music. And they were expecting her to, uh, to get into uh, the Curtis Institute, and she did not get accepted. Uh, there was only one spot for uh, a token black student, and that was already uh, taken. And so when she was unable to get into a college or conservatory, I should say, for classical music, she switched to singing um, popular music, jazz, um, just w whatever was going on. Um, or uh, I should say, as her, her mother thought it was, that she was playing the devil's music. She started mm -hmm. playing inside of Atlanta, mm -hmm. Atlantic City and became a very famous uh, singer, and people really love her. But one of the most important things about her is that she also, in her later years, about 1963, became an activist and started mm -hmm. writing her own tunes instead of singing standards. And it is this repertoire that makes Nina Simone so beloved and also an interesting person to study and an interesting person to have your students study. Um, so, for example, uh, the song Mississippi Goddamn, that mm -hmm. was the very first song that she wrote uh, on her own, mm -hmm. and it was a protest song. And That's amazing. It was her first song. song. Yeah, I know. That's your first <laughs> song, and that's what you that's what you write. It, that's pretty amazing. Wow. And as she said, it, she said it, she didn't so much um, write it as it just like boiled out of her in a mm -hmm. fury. Mm -hmm. And it's really helpful if if, student, if uh, teachers are looking for things for students to do, they could just take that tune alone and tell them to interpret the tune and and find out what it is that Nina Simone is talking about mm -hmm. because she's talking about events that are that everybody knows so it's kind of a historiographical song so if you you if you're from that time you know exactly every event that she's referencing kind of like how today everybody knows every single minutia of the coronavirus yeah <laughs> you know many many years later people might not know that so this is a really great song for that so um, it was inspired by two pivotal incidents, both that happened in 1963. So the first one was the shooting of Medgar Evers, who was the uh, NAACP secretary, and that happened in Mississippi. And, and I always think it's governor, important to say NAACP secretary means elected official, not somebody who's answering phones. So this was a, this was a political assassination. Yes, it is a political assassination. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, mm -hmm. this is this is what this is, mm -hmm. and um, because the NAACP was um, was registering black voters, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that made it, that made them uh, susceptible to white backlash that wanted to prevent blacks from voting. And in states like Mississippi and in uh, South Carolina, where they had very, where they had black majorities, it was it was definitely a real palpable threat to black privilege. Uh, excuse me, to white privilege. Mm -hmm. So, um, so Medgar Evers was assassinated, and then the governor shook hands with uh, Medgar Evers, acquitted white murderer. Wow. And that was kind of, she described that as the match that lit her fuse. Mm -hmm. And then also the second incident was the 1963 16th Street Baptist Church bombing in Birmingham, Alabama, mm -hmm. that killed four little girls, and it also blinded a fifth girl, and they were attending a Bible class. Um, so those are the two things that she's talking about in that, that song. Alabama's got me so upset. Tennessee made me lose my rest. And everybody knows about Mississippi, goddamn. Um, but there are also other events that she's mentioning as well. So when she says Alabama's got me so upset, she's talking about Dr. Martin Luther King, who was arrested in Birmingham while praying. Mm -hmm. And he wrote his very famous letter from a Birmingham jail there. Mm -hmm. And... Um, 
her close friend, South African singer Miriam McCabe, was exiled in 1963 for speaking out to the United Nations about apartheid. And after the church bombing, Birmingham police killed a black child named Johnny Robinson, um, and a white mob fatally shot a black 13-year-old named Virgil Lamar War, who was riding on his handlebars of his brother's bicycle doing absolutely nothing. Um, just it's the mob just had, yeah, just went to a segregationalist uh, rally and was just kind of all amped up. And, you know, it's, it's important to, to say their names so that we know who they are, who these martyrs were for the, the civil rights movement. So the combination of all of these made Nina so angry that she wanted to, as she said, kill somebody. Mm -hmm. But instead, she, she wrote a song about it, and uh, and what a song it yeah. is. It really changed her career, like I said, from being a uh, supper club singer to uh, becoming a, a black power figure. And she did this, um, I think, at, at least four years before anybody was, was doing anything, before Black Power was written, before um, Amiri Baraka started the Black Arts Movement, um, before Soul on Ice. She she really kind of set this off in a way. I, I don't think that, uh, that women, and particularly Black women, get credit a lot of times for their contributions inside of the Black Power movement. But certainly Nina Simone deserves to be up there with Angela Davis and, and many others. The song is very explosive and theatric, and she literally says it's a show tune that the song hasn't been written for it yet. So what are you paying attention to when you sing it for a live audience, and what can we listen for when we listen to the recordings with our classes? Well, I think that one of the things that you can listen to is the fact that because it's being recorded live, mm -hmm. the audience is not expecting this. So when, you know, they titter at first, like, oh, she said a, she said a naughty word. She said, God damn. And, and the way it starts off, it does sound like a show tune. Alabama has got me so upset. And everybody knows about Mississippi, goddamn. And it kind of sounds almost a little hokey and happy. And then her chords change to minor. Mm -hmm. And it sounds darker, like an African chant. Mm -hmm. And she tells the crowd, you thought I was kidding, didn't you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she lists all of the things that her people are going through. Um, so, for example, she says, hound dogs on my trail which in, during that time the dogs were set on civil rights activists and it was reminiscent of the dogs that were used by patty rollers to track runaway slaves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, school children sitting in jail. Um, the police jailed a group of black school children for protesting against racial discrimination in Birmingham, Alabama, 1963. And today more and more black children are still being jailed yes. and they're still being charged as adults. Um, a black cat crossed my path. Being born black was enough to give somebody bad luck. Mm -hmm. I think every day is going to be my last. Uh, Nina Simone said that the FBI persecuted her, but also that she was a black-skinned woman in a country you could just be killed for that single fact. Yeah. Um, and she also says, I even stopped believing in prayer. And for a person that has grown up in the church, I mean, she grew up playing organ and piano in the church, and her whole church rallied around her to give her lessons and to support her to go to, to school and to go to conservatory. So for her to show that, say something, I've stopped believing in prayer, it shows utter despair. And many of the aims that the movement had fought for and looked like that they were finally on their way. The Civil Rights Act was made law in 1964 and the Voting Rights Act in 1965. And she knew that even though the these laws were passed, that didn't mean that they were going to be protected, and it didn't mean that they were going to be automatically implied in every state. So you know, she doesn't know where do we where do we go from here? Um, and she talks about stand up and being counted with all of the rest. Mm -hmm. um, she used to um, call the audience to arms. She turned her concerts into a political rally. Um, I had the privilege of seeing her several times, and it, it was like being in a political rally. And she'd always, you know, go to whatever was the current issue of that time, even if it made you completely uncomfortable. So 
So um, one of the things that she did back then was she would ask, is SNCC in the house? And by SNCC, she meant the Student for Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Mm. Those were also um, a, just a, another student group that was also registering voters and was trying to gain black rights. And she would have them stand up and make the crowd applaud. So this time, she wants you to stand up and stand up for black rights and be counted with all of the other people. And, um, and you could go through the, the, I could go through the entire song, but, you know, it, it's something that if you could have your students look at the song and just, just, and just try to figure out which events that she's talking about, mm-hmm. you know, and what were, what were those events? You know, what was Martin Luther King doing at that time? And what was the reaction to, uh, to him being jailed inside of Birmingham? That's great. Yeah, I think if we can go line by line, that would be a wonderful exercise in terms of trying to understand the song. I have one last question about that song. I was teaching it in the fall, and I had a student who asked if perhaps the entire song is actually a prayer. What do you think of that? Um, I, I, I think that, you know, in, in a way, you could you could interpret that. But if we just look at Nina's own words, if we read the autobiogra- autobiography of Nina Simone, um, she becomes very, very disillusioned mm-hmm. with the idea of prayer. Mm-hmm. And later on, you know, you if we look at um, why the king of love is dead, another tune that she wrote after the assassination of, of Martin Luther King. She was she was very bitter. She laughed very bitterly at Martin Luther King only having a Bible to protect him. She's beyond, she's really beyond that point. And if you look at her concert inside of Harlem, you know, she is incendiary. She tells the crowd that we need to smash white things, Mm -hmm. destroy white ideals, and smash black ownership. I mean, she's really, really, really radical. And you can hear the the airplanes flying over her concert so that they can track her and the crowd. Um, she, I don't, I don't really believe that it's it's a prayer in the, in the in a Christian sense. Maybe inside of an African mantra kind of sense, is in a chant. Uh, you know, she's practicing something with her music, and that uh, puts her inside of uh, a certain state. But she definitely made a, a very cl- a very clear break from uh, the Southern Christian leadership of churches into something that was more radical. I think that's a really helpful transition because I think that that really dramatizes and personifies the the choice that was being made during the civil rights movement. This concept of uh, nonviolence, direct action, or do you need to go to more drastic terms? And clearly, Nina Simone um, felt that it was imperative that we do. So you mentioned her other song, The King of Love is Dead, which she recorded in 1968. Um, could you could you talk briefly about that song and the context of it? Well, this song was, uh, this song was written right after um, Martin Luther King was assassinated, and um, again, it was another song that was written just in a moment, in a rush, with her brother, and recorded the first time that she ever performed it, mm-hmm. just like Mississippi Goddamn. Mm-hmm. And um, and and there, it, she we see a Nina Simone that is maybe a little more. Um, she, she's not as, uh, as explosive as she was before. You know, when, when the other people were killed, it made her, made her very angry. Mm-hmm. Um, but the assassination of Martin Luther King, as you can hear inside of the song, is what the emotion that you get is utter despair, mm-hmm. you know. And, you know, that's why it's called Why. Mm-hmm. And, um... So she stated that the entire program that she was performing the evening was dedicated to his memory. And um, she talked about turning the other cheek, he would plead, love thy neighbor was his creed. Pain, humiliation, and death he did not dread. With his Bible by his side, 
and then she laughs very bitterly. From his foes, he did not hide. It's hard to think that this great man is dead. And she really thinks, from this song, you can tell she thinks, my goodness, if you're going to kill the, the, most mo the most moderate, conservative person in the entire black equality civil rights movement, that's the, that, that, that represented the most moderate leader. Yeah. If you're going to kill him, somebody who only preached love and goodwill and nonviolence, what, what's going to happen to this country? What's going to happen? Will my country stand or fall? And is it too late for us all? And did Martin Luther King just die in vain? So there she's expressing that she thinks that, she, that they may never see equal rights. Maybe this was all for naught. Um, and, you know, it's important to remember that, you know, when there she's talking about all of these things, you know, pain, humiliation, and death, that Coretta Scott King, you know, his, his family's on the line, his wife is on the line, his children are on the line. They're, you know, having to deal with um, bombs and, and uh, police and, and random shooters all the time, all the time. And this is the kind of things that happened to make this movement happen. It wasn't just, you know, they went out and, you know, and they, they preached some love and said some prayers and people gave in. They went through daily humiliation and daily um, get, getting beat um, and, you know, and getting killed. There were, it was a bloodbath inside of the 60s. You know, we think of 60s as, oh, this is a time of peace and love. But for black people, it was not a hippy-dippy peace and love. You know, it was extremely, extremely violent and very, very bloody, and a lot of people died. Um, so... You know, that this is one of the, the big things to, to take away from why the King of Love is dead.